in the yard of the residency that there was also a pop-up bar. And I decided to go with a performance, as you can uh, see, which is a serving performance. I asked from the coordinator of the program, Frederick Veda, and a, per and a performer to serve for 30 minutes the guests of the exhibition. Uh, holding these ceramic utilities, I've made uh, like extended wine carafes and serving plates, and the neck carafes, the handmaids I did, and also the bricks attached to their shoes. And what do I, uh, the, the piece I was stemming from the distance between the person who is being served and the person who is serving. And I wanted to touch upon women's role as a hostess and a caretaker and question social work regardless gender. Something that was very important to me was the, the invitation to Frederic, who was the coordinator of the program, because I also wanted to point out like um, the unseen labor also in the art field. We know all these big exhibitions with the very celebrated curators and artists, and sometimes um, the whole backstage team stays um, unrecognized. Um, Adding to that, uh, yeah, I said so. So I will go to the next project that will bring us closer to what uh, reproductive labor is and why I was interested in that. In 2018, I was invited in an exhibition in the Archicultural University of Athens um, where I came across of this object, which is an old um, cow breast stimulator that would uh, teach the students how to milk a cow. Also at that time, my best friend Josetta um, had just gave birth to her child and I was introduced for the first time to um, the contemporary breast pumps that I didn't know before. So taking the line from the unseen labor I mentioned before, I started being interested in the domestic sphere and work and the very old demand about housework wages. I was introduced to the work of Nancy Fraser, an American scholar and philosopher, where in her text, Contradictions of Capital and Care, argues that reproductive labor, traditionally attached to women, of course, has been undervalued in relation to economic production, traditionally attached to men, to men. and she writes, Non-waged social reproductive activity is necessary to the existence of wage work, oh, Non-wage social production activity is necessary to the existence of wage work, the accumulation of surplus value, and the functioning of capitalism as such. None of those things could exist in the absence of housework, uh, child rearing, schooling, affective care, and a host of other activities, which serve to produce new generation of work workers and replenish existing ones, as well as to maintain social bonds and certain understandings. Social reproduction is an indispensable background condition for the possibility of economic production in a capitalist society. So the piece I made back in the Agriculture University um, took the title Practicing Pleasure Where Possible. The ceramic exhibits borrow their forms from modern and ancient breast pumps and the objects are found in the school, as well as sound producing objects such as megaphones and fives. All ceramic objects have holes from both sides in an attempt to refer to the action of transfer of liquid, air, sound, but most importantly, to that of feeding. The metallic grids that function as showcases make reference to the gossip table. Gossip table is a piece of furniture that consists of a sitting area stretching to a table where the telephone is located. In Greek, Cossack table has a female pronoun, and even worse, we use the same, um, the same name for the gossip table with that of the gossip lady, gossip women. So the ceramics hanging on electric cables, highlighting the idea of transformation and physical substance transmission. This piece acts as a as a score and nod to the idea of care that is emphasized through the use of soft towels, which is also very usual material in sculpture and uh, ceramics. 
Overall, with the work, I, ex I explore the transformation of society from agriculture to industrial, underlining the different roles uh, the woman takes on patriarchal Western societies. The piece was located in front of the ceremony hall of the school, where in these marbles in, in the back, there, are the, there is a list of all, with all the past deans of the school, which are all, of course, all of course men. Um, so I think uh, the link between uh, the two things, like the work that is celebrated and this that it is un unseen, I think it's quite clear, and that it is the labor that is necessary actually for a system to function. I will, I have six more minutes, so maybe I don't have to rush that much, but we will see. Um, I will go now to the work we do with 3137, um, where 3137 is actually a space the image is not, ah, yeah, it's a space, is where we practice our individual practices. And it's uh, also where we run a program, a public program since 2012. And as a, as a trio, we also do uh, sometimes um, uh, projects uh, abroad as the one today. Um, so one of the main aspects of what we do that it's is sharing our personal space. So going from uh, notions of hospitality in my work, I think some of these notions exist also in what we do also in our common space in Athens, in Exarchia. So uh, I tend to, I'm interested in linking, I'm mean, going from the domestic space to the public space and from the personal to the collective, from the single, the single to the collective. Here is in 2012, one of the first dinners we made, which is outside of our studio, which was set in a first come, first served manner. Uh, besides the performativity of the work that I won't get into details now, is that uh, we, wanted, we were sure that we wanted to serve also the people that they weren't able to sit in the table. So food sharing is an act that can connect um, uh, the domestic with the public, and it's an ancient trick of how to bring people together, together and create uh, a, a common experience. Since then, we have done many projects around food, but one that I would like to share with you today, and I think it's worth mentioning, is a benefit dinner we did in 2015 with a state of concept and an art organization in Athens and with the artist Maro Michalakaku. Um, we were, uh, as quite small organizations at that time, uh, we'd done everything on our own, worked in a DIY uh, situation, and we were the hosts, the performers, um, the waitresses. So as you can understand, I wanted to stay in the, um, in the economy behind the, the notion of care. Uh, because I do believe that if we change the way we perceive labor and economy when talking about care, is, is, is a way to understand productivity um, in, a, in a new way, in a different way, and to also recognize the efforts of uh, those that uh, do all the, the labor to sustain the system. And now I will uh, go more quickly to the last project I want to share with you, which is around labor, art, and the erotic audition. This is not a love song. It's a publication we did last year together with Ilaria Conti, a curator um, that back then she, was, uh, work, she had just finished her work in Serge in Centre Pompidou, and now after two years of uh, being stuck in Europe, she's finally going, uh, because of the pandemic, I mean, she's going back to the um, US. Um, the, the, the book is around uh, the working conditions in, in the art sector, so going again to our common uh, working environment. And what Ilaria brought to the table at that time was the idea of aura, aura that she, she thought of this hell of power that uh, stays around uh, and above art institutions and professionals. Um, what we try to do uh, through the book, we try to materialize um, this idea 
through different ways, but um, the book has a great contribution in Europe and in the US. I won't uh, go into detail in order to be able to uh, share all my thoughts with you, but where I want to, to stay is into the parameter of love. Uh, to bringing in the to in the beginning, uh, where law for uh, for us stands in this in between a situation of passion and uh, work, all these efforts that we do, um, thinking that we are doing something that we really love, but this uh, could lead us to um, could le lead us to an an. Uh, under recognized, uh, under uh, paid uh, collaboration. And um, to conclude, and I went really fast, excuse me, I hope you were able to follow. Um, what I wanted, um, uh, what I, where I want to conclude is that uh, thinking of uh, care work, if we end the fair art ecosystem, if it is um, to create one, we are, uh, we have to recognize that the sustainability of the system comes uh, from care work and from the work um, happening in the background. And it's uh, important to also monitor the work that we do. So this is in the end of the book, where it's like in these pizza slices, you count the hours that you work, and in the boxes, like the different aspects that you had, the different uh, things that you had to do in a day, and to share the personal with the working uh, time, and most importantly, to embrace um, care as an aspect of what we do, and to understand that the knowledge contained in reproductive labor, like the, the knowledge that um, stays there, can lead us to a different understanding of production, first of all, so to understand products uh, producing in a different way, and to feminize our uh, work and life, and to produce more uh, solidarity as and Natasha greatly said in the beginning that is very needed in, for our life. So thank you. Uh, Hello, Falava. My name is Leolia Shradi. I am presenting Knowing and Being Where We Are in Great Ocean Visual Arts as part of this panel and wish I could be there in person with you in Dubai. Ilene Itula, Avea Yellow Uleo, Efaimo Fungata Moli Moli, Lefala Pat Potonga, Atangata Mao Ioni Paluna, Efata Lofa Atuma Fafe Loaia to Lepa Iama Malamalu Leaso, Tato Malo, Fao Alongia, I Maisili Paia, Malamamalu Ole Neta Yao, Ifanua Atangata Mao Io, Muinina I Malato Io, Malole Soifua, Malole Soifua Manuia. I recognize the relationships, knowledges, and governance of lands and waters in the occupied territory of the Muinina people of Nipaluna, from where I speak to you today, as well as those indigenous peoples from where you are joining me. I bring my Samoan, Persian, and Cantonese ancestors' teachings of good conduct and peace to this gathering. In this short presentation, I will trace my lived experience of land recognition or acknowledgement of country practices as a curator and critic, as I have just pronounced one. These are what I would qualify as practices of humility that decenter humans, strengthen ceremonial binds, and challenge enlightenment held biases as transposed and expressed in the settler colonies of Australia and Canada. For the tens of thousands of years that Indigenous polities and peoples have thrived across the territories occupied by these settler states, both so called Australia since Gregorian year 1788 and so called Canada since Gregorian year 1604, are very young if powerful presences. I will close with delving into reading rooms as sites of collective care for cu cultural memory cu that constitute and hold space, in particular for local and diasporic indigenous cultures, intellectual and aesthetic practices, which continue under duress and erasure in these same nation state contexts. 
Institutional statements of land recognition or acknowledgement of country in both so-called Australia and Canada have come about as forms of acceptability politics in recent decades. From recognizing the place of the institution and or event as taking place on lands and waters long inhabited by currently colonized, displaced and oppressed Indigenous peoples, these statements abide by many local Indigenous protocols in various territories. They also do not imply any concrete measures in their most formulaic repetition across the cultural sector, at the outset of meetings and in email signatures, to equity, to redress, and to the undoing of ongoing colonial impacts on named Indigenous peoples. So, understanding that to individually pronounced recognition of Indigenous ownership and custodianship of lands and waters indelibly altered and occupied by settler colonists, overwhelmingly but not exclusively drawn from European empires, there is a distinction to be grasped here when such pronouncements are made by the institution particularly when major cities host important and well-resourced cultural institutions located directly upon indigenous villages, cities, burial and ceremonial sites. These statements of land recognition or acknowledgement of country are performative and like any application that might alter financial, political and sociocultural domination. Indigenous activists, artists and curators have repeatedly made calls for measures that go beyond the symbolic to encompass unconditional return of funds, lands, waters, cultural collections, and the hiring and to the hiring and retaining of Indigenous employees across organizations, and particularly in roles with budgetary and programmatic oversight. To paraphrase the canonical 2012 essay by Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang, even by its title, decolonization is not simply a metaphor, a trend. It is a demand, it is a demand for genuine and unconditional restitution. In the case of the Archive of New South Wales, I can speak from experience working there in sharing that any and all meetings that cover First Nations cultures, art practices and peoples are required to have multiple First Nations members of staff present. This is a solid gesture of recognition that is more than simple lip service and is in addition to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Group of Elders and industry experts that provides counsel to the institution. I am inspired by Cyrus Marcus Ware's important essay, Give Us Permanence, Ending Anti-Black Racism in Canada's Art Institutions. Alison Cooley, Amy Luo, and Kiva Morgan Fears, Peace Canada, Canada's Galleries Fall Short, The Not So Great White North, on the overwhelming white stable of solo shows. Sean O'Neill's piece, A Crisis of Whiteness in Canada's Art Museums, on the ethnic makeup of senior leadership and boards, and the 2020 piece by Travis DeVries, What the Arts Can Learn from Black Lives Matter on decolonizing institutions. I am informed by many conversations, essays and exposés with indigenous and settler co uh, colleagues across Canada, New Zealand and Australia, which bring me to the conclusion that the visual arts sector needs to be more honest about performativity and recalcitrance. By performativity, I mean the semblance of allyship and humility towards indigenous and diasporic Asian, African and Great Ocean aesthetic and intellectual practices and by recalcitrance, I mean the resistance towards any ambitious unsettling of the status quo in so-called Australia and Canada. Thankfully, regional art museums often collaborate more openly with indigenous and racialized curators, public programmers, and executives, despite the usual temporal nature, temporary nature of such collaborations due to institutional size and the means of engagement. The Australian Museums and Galleries Association, AMAGA's visionary report, First Peoples, a roadmap for enhancing Indigenous engagement in museums and galleries is a collective voicing by First Nations peoples and authored by the Indigenous-owned law firm, Terry Jenke and Company, on how increased presence and sovereignty can be achieved. As has been learned in many a boardroom or open plan office dominated by a certain privileged population, the presence alone of non-white peoples is not enough to effect a change and to fulfill the promise of land recognition or acknowledgement of country statements. There must also be a deep soul searching and the redressing of the status quo from top to bottom, from department to department of curatorial decision making in these territories, so called Australia and Canada. From 2016 to 19, I edited in collaboration with local and global Indigenous colleagues and peers across Turtle Island, Hawaii, Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Australia, two directories of our representation in public art museums centers of contemporary art, media, and art schools. These community responsive tables were edited intermittently by all of us in an effort to locate where we were and where we weren't, 
I would keep everyone abreast of major updates through posting about the tables into the How Do You Say MFA in Your Language private Facebook group founded by Haida Canadian artist Raymond Bojoli or the Indigenous Curatorial Collective, Collective de Commissas Autochtones public Facebook group. Most alarming in our findings five years ago was the trend of double the Indigenous identified curatorial roles existing in Australian public art museums and centres of contemporary art than in their equivalents in Canada. And conversely, double the number of Indigenous and other racialized academic appointments in Canadian art schools, with the gap significantly widening through successive ambitious cluster hires. All this while academic and student demographics at Australian art schools remain as dominated as ever by the Anglo-Celtic majority, with the Womanjika Jimbana Indigenous Research Lab at Monash University Art Design and Architecture, and the Contemporary Australian Indigenous Art Program at the Queensland College of Art at Griffith University, being the exceptions rather than a trend towards reparations and redress of historical inequalities. Despite the recent, despite the numerous recent cluster hires in Canadian art schools, only Concordia University with the Indigenous Futures, Indigenous Futures Research Centre and the and OCAD University with Wapata Centre for Indigenous Visual Knowledge are dedicated spaces for Indigenous creative agency and research that concretize the promise within often repeated land recognition statements. <clears throat> the most recent iterations of these tables of representation were completed for the Color Chart, a research creation residency I undertook last year with the University of New South Wales Galleries, and which culminated in an essay published in Art Monthly Australia and the artwork Kinship Flag, with which I opened this presentation. Black and brown leadership has not yet reached the highest levels of executive direction, though the Art Gallery of Western Australia, Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, National Gallery of Australia and Australian Museum have all recently brought senior leadership roles focused on First Peoples into place with respected First Nations peoples at their helm. At the Mackenzie Art Gallery, Musée d'Art Mackenzie in Regina, Saskatchewan, the development of an equity task force with binding timelines and deliverables has been welcomed as a solid institutional commitment to change, redress and reparative measures. While ongoing, this is a notable outlier across the many cultural institutions operating in so-called Canada and Australia. Speaking of the problematic representations and participation in literary world-making of Latinx communities in white-dominated Quebec society, Karine Rousseau reiterates that to truly testify to a fuller sense of Americanity or hemispheric consciousness, white Quebec Quebecers must <clears throat> embrace their foundational diasporic narrative and muddy it with acceptance of complex intersectional histories of indigenous and racialized immigrant minorities. I would extend this from Canadian institutions of culture to Australian institutions of culture, where in a once in a generation soul searching moment of reflection brought about by neoliberalism and the COVID-19 pandemic must be the occasion of a holistic rebirth of these institutions for futures of relevance and collective ownership to be theirs. To bring this discussion of land recognition or acknowledgement of country statements in the context of the concrete measures that such performative and sometimes formulaic pronouncements can actually have, beyond the few examples of equity task forces and Indigenous advisory groups across the sector, I want to return to a project I curated in 2016. First Languages of the Monash University Collection sought to align new writing in, indig in Indigenous and non-English languages with works by celebrated First Nations and diasporic racialized artists within the Monash University art collection. This came about through multiple years of discussions between curators, faculty members, and myself as a then PhD candidate at the same institution. I commissioned new writing by indigenous curators, Clotilde Bullen, Kimberly Moulton, Kara Kirkwood, and Pedro Wanaymiri, as well as fellow PhD candidate, Chilean curator, Camila Marambio, and artists Lilia, Lilia Balval, Juan Davila, Kitty Cantilla, Tiriki Ones, and Ricardo Bumba Peterson some of which were in turn translated into Chilean Spanish, Tiwi, and Mardu. Monash University Museum of Art was able to continue this project for two more years under the expert ages of curator Shepperton Art Museum Belinda Briggs of the Yoru Yoru people and Zoe Rimmer of the Pacana people, who is senior curator of First Peoples Art and Culture at the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery. Both of these curators commissioned numerous texts and translations 
which together are present across Manash University campuses and when viewing the art collection online. The aspect of this project that I am most proud of was working closely with Wurundjeri Woiwurrung artist, dancer, and translator Mandy Nicholson and Bunwurrung senior elder and translator Narwi Carolyn Briggs, who is senior Indigenous Research Fellow of Practice at Womanjika Jimbana Indigenous Research Lab, to realize a land recognition statement that was translated into both local First Nations languages, Woiwurrung and Bunwurrung. This statement greets visitors at the entrance of the Monash University Museum of Art, as well as online, and is one of the rare examples of such translation in cultural institutions in Australia. Though it is evident to these two First Nations that the voice behind the text is the settler colonial institution, of course. Another form of Latin recognition or acknowledgement of country that has been deployed across multi mostly curatorial but sometimes also artistic projects I have been involved in leading in recent years is the reading room. With all the structural barriers for First Nations and diasporic racialized communities, leadership in cultural institutions and in education, educational spaces in so-called Canada and Australia that I've discussed until now, reading rooms that serve as sites where Indigenous cultures are centered and critically appraised became pertinent and an obvious strategic use of space for me. The reading room is a spatial offering to audiences and institutional staff alike that can make modes of passing time, sharing poetry or narrative, researching, studying and reflecting, challenge the all-consumptive imperative under neoliberal capitalism. I deployed a reading room in my 2019 commission, Tanata Nu'u, for Sharjah Biennial 14 exhibition, Leaving the Echo Chamber, Journey Beyond the Arrow, curated by Zoe Butt, as an intellectual and aesthetic anchor space to the performance installation in the adjacent gallery. Particularly as I was the first, very first Samoan artist and only the third great ocean artist to exhibit in Sharjah alongside celebrated Napuhi Ngatihina Ngaitu artist, Lisa Rehanna in Sharjah Biennial 14, and after Haku artist, Taloi Havini in Sharjah Biennial 13 in 2017. For Tangata Nu'u, the reading room comprised cushions, plants, important texts related to the content of my performance and its installation, to indigenous languages and aesthetics of the Great Ocean and Turtle Island, North America, as well as to our orators, literatures, and tattooed narratives. As a curator, critic, and artist from one of the archipelagic indigenous peoples inhabiting the center of the largest oceanic expanse on this planet, I am used to navigating the bounds of education and literacy in our art forms, histories, and aesthetics. Hence, this more generous gesture of the reading room. The commute held at the Institute of Modern Art Brisbane in 2018 was the first in a series of transoceanic exhibitions reflecting and speculating on ancestral trade and ceremonial roots across the great ocean, as well as future connections between peoples and kin creatures. The following exhibitions were Layover at Art Space Aotearoa Auckland, New Zealand in 2019, and Transits and Returns at the Vancouver Art Gallery, Canada, 2019 to 20. The first exhibition featured generously, generously supported commissions by eight artists and a five person Indigenous curatorial team to greatly enhance the support in dreaming up, funding, and realizing the artist's dreams, visions. In each exhibition, we also included a space for gaining transnational literacy in the aesthetic, intellectual, and linguistic spaces, practices, sorry, of the artists and curators represented. Through reading rooms featuring either my personal collection of global indigenous art history, theory, and curation, or texts purchased specifically for an exhibition, these spaces are a way to encourage collective tending to cultural memory and traditions more ancient and yet more vulnerable to erasure from outside a perceived, from being outside a perceived European canon. Through the presence and reading, studying, sharing of various publications, but especially through individual and collective activations, organized or random, the physical and relational library of sorts constitutes and makes real the promise of learning and being through indigenous art. All this despite the significant structural pressures of settler colonial states in so-called Australia and Canada, wherein erasure and marginalization are the usual experience of indigenous art practices and histories, and most of all, of territories and peoples. Thank you for your attention today, and I welcome any questions and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you.
I'm sure we have many questions for Dr. Ashragi, and it's a pity that he could not be with us, or they could not be with us um, this evening. But I'd like to invite our presenters today for a discussion amongst ourselves and then a few of the people in the room. Um, I'd like to begin um, by uh, inviting Byron and Cosmos, members of 3137, who are here with us today. Hello. Um, and returning to the film that we saw at the beginning, uh, Digital Druidism, and the notion of um, individual wellness, um, and the onus sort of being on the individual for self-care, and the idea that you know, in, in the face of increasing digitization, especially the, the last two years that we have lived through, um, which has kind of increased alienation somehow. Um, you know, and, and our precarity feels even more <laughs> pronounced. Even more pronounced, um, really. How do, we, how do we sort of, like, how does your work, um, uh, you know, tell that experience? There is, it, it really felt with that figure of the individual running through the city or moving through those this different digitized atmospheres that there's a kind of uh, uh, individual that you are pointing towards. Um, and also, if you could tell us a bit more about this Element. talisman that seems to match <laughs> my outfit very well today. <laughs> First of all, thank you for the question. Uh, it will help me to present our common work. And I would like to thank all of in the team, al Carl, you, Kevin, Smithy, Bader, everyone, that we are here. Uh, Personally, and in 3137, we have a long-lasting relationship with the space, uh, with the place and al Cal, so we are happy being back. Um, before I answer to your uh, question, I would like to add something that somehow gives an information for the piece, but also gives a, a first layer to the, uh, to the question. Um, in 3137, we curate the program and we, we have a common we have a, we have a communication and discussion piece between us, and it's a space that we discuss our common ideas, and this is somehow the program comes to the fore. But uh, now in in ten days we are turning ten, so after ten years we having we have a body of work to have done together, but in the beginning it was not like that. So our common practice uh, brings to the fore our interest, our interests, and our some ideas. And also, uh, by time passing, we work with other people. And also for this piece, let's say if we if we say it very very by the book, that creative direction was done by us, Chrysanthi, Paki, and I. And from the implementation, we have a collective. Um, creative discussion with Daphne, Daphne Heretakis for the video, uh, Marios Vitis for the sound, that we worked all together, but we were having also a, a discussion, and with Byron for the talisman. So, But it was not as, uh, an individual part, like we were coordinating the discussion. So it's very interesting that, uh, it's very to the point what we're asking about in the individuality, but also um, the piece is a common effort. So um, the whole idea was like, we started from uh, the idea of uh, creating something like um, uh, has to do with a pose, a meditation, a meditative atmosphere. Then it came the, the idea of uh, rituals, personal rituals. And somehow from one thing to the other, also it came the idea of uh, sound and light, of a non-verbal gesture. Also, I would like to thank you for saying the work film or video, I don't remember. Uh, I wish it, it can stand as a film or a video, it's more an intervention. Uh, so, uh, we, so we started, so we stopped this, day with this discussion and we started again with the idea of light. So uh, I have to reveal now that the light uh, show, the lighting show that we started in the beginning, it's inspired by the Emirates aircraft 
but they have a specific lighting for relaxes your nerves when you're flying different to different time zones. So we create this long gesture of bringing people together, touching uh, their, triggering their uh, senses, and then um, by talking about the. Um, the, the, the idea of a, a, a routine and, an, and an also an individual practice that you do by yourself and also it's for, your, for, for the good of your health, for your mental uh, stability. Also we realize that sometimes all these kinds uh, of hobbies, they are becoming elements of your CV, of your representation, digitally and physically. So we played with these different layers. So. In the reality, uh, we had the discussion, we did the art direction, and I'm running myself, and this is one of the routine, my routines. When I don't have time, I run in the road. When I have time, I go in the lit this little hill. And you can listen to my brief that it, I'm not an athlete, so you can listen that I struggle. <laughs> and we realize that uh, I do it, but I struggle. Uh, so we realize that uh, all this, um, we took this, um, decision with Daphne to, to, to wear a GoPro on my, on my head. So this image was very digital. So step by step, th this, all these elements that we have together were integrating in the, into the piece. So we would like to create this um, uh, point of critique about what is physical and what is uh, digital and how we live between these different um, layers that are becoming more and more aware nowadays. And also then uh, we, we, we turn around a lot, we looked, around, we looked a lot the idea of enhancing, of boosting ourselves. And also with the last two years that medical papers are coming to the headlines every other day and everyone has a medical opinion for the vaccine mm -hmm. or for whatever. Um, we talked a lot about the boosting and enhancing. So we would like to have a symbol that can uh, in an absorbed way, bring this uh, element of care to the fore, but also this is, uh, this um, symbol in, engineered by Byron together with Byron, and he's a very good, uh, beyond very, very good artist. He's a very good designer, so you can see that this could open and it works perfectly because of his <laughs> engineer ability. So this talisman is a jewel, but also it works as a pill case. So we had this and it's, we distributed empty. So the idea of like, it's a kind of a, of an, on, of a call, of an occult, of, of a, like of a sect that we are running, we meet every night, every day for something that is abstract and it helps us. <laughs> but also you can boost yourself with your food supplements that also it's between care and boosting, physical and uh, artificial. So we try to bring all this layer in a critical way and also we'd like to do it also in a way that triggers the senses. That's why the long shot in the mm -hmm. beginning was only with colors. Uh, I think yeah. I talked about that, <laughs> <laughs> but I can we'll, answer. We'll come back okay, to it. Of course. Um, Byron, would you like to add anything more about the I think the from um, touching on something that Cosma said in terms of how the digital, digital meet the physical, I think, one of the processes that we use to f manufacture this is uh, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, which mm -hmm. is part of digital uh, fabrication, as it's um, so-called. And in that, design happens purely in a digital space, but then is uh, materialized kind of um, out of nowhere in mm -hmm. uh, in like a physical form, fully functional. And yeah, and it was kind of... Uh, uh, the right trajectory, I think, from how the methodology of the project uh, uh, unraveled. Thank yeah. you. And it's interesting also this sort of urban forest environment that um, that becomes this kind of lung uh, space in, yes, in the yes. video. It's five minutes from our studio, five minutes walk. Wow. Um, which kind of brings us naturally to talk about Adib's project. And Adib is, uh, I guess, um, working uh, through an organization called Another Dada, based out of Beirut. Um, and it would be nice, Adib, to hear not just about the organization, but maybe also to go back to some of the ideas that Natasha introduced in her um, presentation around this idea of the long term or the long durée. 
And of course, working in Beirut at the moment, you are constantly responding to crises, and it was wonderful to see how this current disaster has been somehow commemorated and folded into your project. But of course, the very act of planting a tree is also a gesture towards the future. Um, and it's interesting to see how this kind of temporality plays out in bringing a community together in the present, but also speaking to a community to come. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I started this project because I, you know, I've, I've been working and researching the state of the Beirut River. So this kind of concrete sewage river that, you know, the, the current system had deemed as not valuable. So they just concreted it and threw all this sewage in it and then the garbage and then, you know, everything else. So it's how do you revalorize these types of spaces, the leftover spaces and all of that. And um, after, you know, after a while of, of kind of, you know, a lot of activism work and all of this, um, we found that, you know, we can't really necessarily impact that, you know, social class or the political class. But what we could do is that we could start implementing the change that we wanted to see and that we needed uh, also for our own um, self-care. And um, this is where the idea that, like, came to, to, um, to restore that forest that used to exist next to the river. And that's our indirect way of bringing people back to the space. So the space that used to be very vibrant before 1968 and then became totally like a no man's land. It was an urban landfill, um, you know, before, before we got to it. And, um, and the, the, the act of planting a tree is not, um, uh, how do you say, like, it, it's not perceived as a political act. It's not perceived as threatening. So okay, it bridges across, you know, our like political, religious polarization we have in Lebanon. And it's like everyone's be like, oh yeah, planting a tree, yes, of course, like that's a good idea. Uh, but for us, it's actually a very political act because by planting, we're actually reclaiming that land that is not valued by the current system. And we're reclaiming it in, a, in an effort to give it back to the community, whether that community is like a human community or the natural um, community. And of course, it's happening right now, but it's a project that will, you know, hopefully outlive us, outlive us, and you know, be left for future generations. Um, so this idea of temporal temporality and not responding to the crisis as it's happening, but actually also taking the step back uh, <coughs> and thinking about the future. You know, what are the future crises that are coming, and what do we, what can we start doing right now? So that's that's where this comes from. <coughs> Thank you. Sorry. Um, and I think that also somehow links back to Dr. Shragi's kind of uh, talking about the ancestors and what we can learn from indigenous knowledges. And I think especially in, in this region, when thinking about desertification and planting, those, those techniques really need to come from the region themselves. Um, Paki, my last question will be for you. And then if you have questions for each other, uh, I think we can continue. But um, let's talk about love. <laughs> and, and the question I had is, you know, in, in the kind of emotional labor that goes into the type of work that you do in, as an individual, uh, as a feminist within 3137, how do you do this kind of uh, research into the conditions of precarity and, and labor and and, you know, I guess exhaustion often, um, but still maintain our, your ability to remain vulnerable and to remain generative and to remain somehow generous. Yeah. It's interesting mm -hmm. because I do realize now that I was saying the economics of care, but it is the word money, I think, that comes with love <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and creates love a and contradiction money. there. <laughs> So, um, uh, yeah, well, this is what I wanted to point out, that when it comes into um, uh, everyday life, into um, trying to maintain yourself, your family, your um, uh, community, there is a need of uh, material um, reimbursement. Um, and that if we realize um, the depth, as you said, the the emotions and um, the time consumed in these um, uh, aspects of uh, being together, which is about care, 
and we we celebrate them and give them that's why i said not to commodify in them but to really to understand value. to value exactly yeah. Um, then I think in different, of course, uh, places, there is a different way to, to research more and to, um, and to go deeper to it and to implement it into, into the life. So, yeah, I mean, in Greece, uh, now we are in a moment that we're discussing a lot about um, unions. They're back in fashion. And... Um, Anyway, so this is a way of uh, bringing solidarity again into the art field and thinking uh, care as, as, the, as a way of treating others and that brings, uh, that create bonds among the members. So this is um, the whole thought of it. And this notion of, I guess, commoning and care and collectivity is something that, um, you know, uh, should be, in a way, uh, obviously well-resourced, well-funded, uh, but also I find that cultural institutions are, are having to take on the work uh, of public service, of kind of providing infrastructure, of providing, um, you know, the, the space, really, of creating the space. Um, that that it, maybe a generation before us, uh, especially I guess uh, pre-liberalization, <laughs> um, you know, was provided in other ways. And I think um, you know there is a need um, to form more public-private partnerships and actually find more sustainable funding models and working models. And I think we're living through a really interesting time where, where this generation is, is really starting to question even the value of work. Yeah, and yeah. I think we're very lucky being in a sector that we can talk about non-hierarchies, as Natasha said. Mm -hmm. So when, when talking about these uh, formations, these, these type of synergies, and like also art institutions as a place of work, um, if we manage, I do agree with the first part, as we were discussing before, for sure. And um, I'm also very worried for other aspects, from, for example, in Greece and in Europe, that um, uh, many work that the state or yeah, that the state should take care of is now into NGOs, for example. So I think there is a similarity there in terms mm -hmm. of of the refugee crisis in Europe and etc. But yeah, in the other hand, we are very privileged. We don't have to solve the things, but we are very privileged working in a field where we can talk about different understanding of hierarchy and working relationships. Did you want to add to that, Adi? <laughs> um, I mean, it's, again, for us, it's, it's this kind of... Um, we have to take into our own hands these practices that you know that we want to see. So we need those spaces and we need to create them. And um, as we've seen, when we have a completely dysfunctional system, uh, whether in Lebanon or abroad, it's it's the NGOs, it's civil society that's stepping in, and it does become very. Uh, uh, it's heavy because you know, like you're solving things that you're not necessarily like meant to be meant to be working on. Uh, but it also comes from uh, our work on the ground, from listening to people, from understanding you know what they're going through, and and also in a way, it's maybe it's a little bit selfish. Like in my case, it it brings me a bit of clarity when I'm when I know what I'm working on. Uh, given the very volatile situation in Lebanon. At least I have like something that I'm following that I know. I mean, that in my gut I know is is the right way. So it uh, helps also helps me to to calm down and, uh, and keep going. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, these uh, parts of the you are working a lot close to the river, as far as I can understand. It's one of our major uh, sites. And you are planning to continue as far as it as it's possible. Huh? So the idea for the river project is to really reconnect the natural um, forest, which is up in the mountain, all the way down to the coast. Ah, so, you so to do like a green corridor, 
um, uh, alongside the river, from and the natural river along the concrete. Uh, and the concrete this, uh, corid this corridor will also help the quality of the water uh, in the big scale? Or? So it doesn't help the quality. I mean, it, it will help the quality of the water in the parts where so raw sewage and all sorts of waste are being dumped directly in the natural valley. Okay. And they go through the natural valley mm. and like sewage waterfalls into the riverbed. So um, some parts are no longer forested. So by recreating those, you're helping uh, filter out this, uh, this water. But in the city, there's absolutely no, I no mean, our, forest is, uh, our yeah. forest is not connected to river, yeah. but mm -hmm. it's a way of us getting people there to like, you're raising Find public out, consciousness. You know, they're like, the what is behind that concrete wall or what is that smell? Mm -hmm. And then they discover the river as opposed to me for six years shouting, you know, there's a river here. Why don't you do something about it? So this is like just, oh, why don't you have come? Why don't you come and have a picnic? And then, you know, there's a surprise. Um, yeah, the Miyawaki method that you were talking about seems like it, it could be something that could be adopted across many different regions. I mean, this is our intention, is to really scale this uh, type of uh, approach because we see really, um, I mean, incredible visions uh, in the UAE and mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia on planting millions and billions of trees. But we also mm -hmm. see a lot of failure yeah. um, here and around the world on the way that these are planted. So there's always this saying that it's not about any type of tree. It's like the right tree in the right place at the right time with the right kind of maintenance so that it can, so in our case, in three years' time, these forests become self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. Because we're actually planting, you know, using that indigenous knowledge, we're planting the indigenous, we're bringing back the indigenous ecosystem back to life, which knows how to take care of itself. So it just needs us to catalyze it, to bring it back, and then, you know, it, it can uh, take care mm -hmm. of, its, um, of itself. Cosmos, I wanted to come back to 3137 and the Rhodiola project. Uh, which, of course, also relates back to um, this idea of self-care and optimization, but again, um, you know, trying to uh, create a socially engaged project where people can encounter um, and have those discussions. Um, could you say a few words about that project? It's not all. Yeah, I would, uh, yeah. uh, English is not my mm -hmm. first language, but I would like to add the word resonance. Mm -hmm. we, we, I think, I'm thinking this word as a key word for that project because it was a, a place for resonance that you can be, you can see things that maybe are referred to you and also are similar to you from another view, and also it uh, came to the fore of an idea like it, it's like a radio station that have frequent different frequencies, so. Um, also, I think that uh, the idea of uh, Rodiola was about that, about well-being. Let's mm -hmm. say the idea of the idea of well-being in different uh, views, in the idea uh, the well-being in the community life, body well-being, mental well-being, um, uh, physical well-being, and also the um, the idea of uh, creating this. Um, uh, the, the, also, the, the, the common bridge between then and now is like the idea of uh, branding is very heavy word, the idea of image, what is the, the public view of that, what is the profile that well-being creates, and creates a capital that on one hand it's like very bodily and physically present, but on the other hand can be like a way of man to manipulate your image to have added other kind of added values. Mm -hmm. So I think that we played, uh, I, I, I wish that we are more to the, to the center of this question now every, in every step that mm -hmm. we take. But this is the idea of how, how this well-being from a trend can be also a way to reflect and see things that can make your life better and also create habits and uh, uh, behaviors that can be like, uh, can foster better uh, communi communal experiences mm -hmm. and procedures. So it's, it's a lot about enhancing. Yeah. I don't know, enhancing in English sounds very economical sometimes, but I, 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 I use the word. I survival it. skills. Yes. It's yes, about yes. collective survival skills. Yes, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Let's and, say like. and I think, it, it, okay, this is a big um, 
um, step. But anyway, I think it also link in taking back also an idea of wellness and ritual of yourself after um, yeah a, a, an extreme um, um, isolating. Uh, no, no consumerism about consumerism. It. Yeah, because as uh, I mean, as uh, Europeans or like uh, raised in in with the U.S. Uh, tradition, with you Western want culture. yeah yeah Western <laughs> culture. You want to but also I have claim to say that as Rodiola. As well. Is uh, the mother the new with a newborn <laughs> uh, is a specialist in uh, food supplements? Yes, that's so the trend. How I take trend. it regularly. I yes, know so about she, it. <laughs> she, invent, she invented the name back then yeah. because it was the pill that she was taking yeah. back then. So again, we made a pill case for Rodiola <laughs> <Yeah>. pill. <laughs> thank you, um, thank you so much for thank you. for being with us today. I think. Everything we've talked about feels even more sort of urgent and relevant, um, and hopefully the conversation will continue long after today. Thank you for inviting us. Um, if we could, I think someone has a clicker. There's information about uh, upcoming programs. So we will be talking about food and the future of food on the 26th of February, and then we will be back for Water Week at the end of March. Thank you. Mm -hmm.